On October 8, 2013, Think Global School received a visit from Dilip Simeon while exploring Gandhi Smriti, the museum and sacred space in Delhi where Gandhi's life ended in 1948. Mr. Simeon is a well-known labor historian and public intellectual in India. In order to address the particular interests of TGS students on the topic of Gandhi, he starts by opening the floor to questions and proceeds to deliver detailed explanations that together illustrate how dramatic and complex the story of Gandhi is. Okay, well, I'm happy to be here with all of you and good morning. Have you got any special interest in Gandhi or is it just that one part of the tour you have to go to, uh, Gan you know, to have to study something about Gandhi? Or is there anyone who has been curious? You know, in Brazil, there is a group of people called Sons of Gandhi. I don't know whether you know that, but there's one whole, uh, there's a little town where there's a group which calls itself the Sons of Gandhi. Um, and I only heard about it some years ago. So Gandhi, of course, has had a worldwide impact, but I'm just w wondering whether any one of you has been interested quite independently in Gandhi and for what reason? Yeah. I've heard about his idea of Swaraj, yeah. self-rule, and how he sort of really wanted that to be imparted on India after the loss of, like, after they gained their independence. And I want to learn more about that because I've really heard a little bit of it. It sounds like an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know about his ideas on religion. About? His ideas on religion. Ideas on religion. When he said that he was a Muslim Hindu Christian, but um, I know that someone said that only a Hindu would say that, so I wonder Jinnah. if you know, for Muslims or Christians, only believing in one God, how that would Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, as regards that, him saying that I'm a Hindu as well as a Christian and a Jew and a Muslim and so on, um, that's, in one way you can say that it's Gandhi's own way of saying that there's um, one God or spirituality basically unites everybody. In another way you could say that it is also part of what could be called the, the traditionalist Indian Hinduism. Sanatan Dharma, what is called Sanatan Dharma. So Sanatan Dharma uh, is not very doctrinal. The traditional Indian religiosity is not necessarily fixated on a doctrine or a text or a one holy book. So it's, it's got what is called in theological studies a pagan temperament. And you know paganism basically the idea of there being many gods. The ancient Greek or Roman religions were pagan. So the idea of one God defined in a doctrinal or theological manner is not very important, you know. So there are two different ways you could see what he said. But one of his grandsons wrote a book um, on Gandhi, Rajmohan Gandhi. And he was describing how Gandhi during his trips by ship to and from South Africa, um, you know, on one occasion, there was a terrific storm, you know, and during the storm, everybody started praying. And uh, of course, there were people of different faiths. So he said, Gandhi realized then that all these messages are being sent to the same address. People, whether they are Muslims or Hindus or Christians or whatever, they're praying in a storm and they're caught at sea. Obviously, they must be praying, the, the message must be going the same place. Uh, so he had an attitude towards religiosity, which was very respectful and very steeped in his own religiosity. But it didn't, it sought some reconciliation. The idea was that Godhead and spirituality and the spiritual reality and the cosmic reality is one. And there's act, they're just different paths to the same goal. That was his approach to religion. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Is, is there anybody else who had any questions or any uh, problems in mind, yeah? I was more interested on violence and non-violence in the contemporary world. So, in my understanding, the causes of the Muslim for that drive 
for either a traffic accident or a rape that might have not even happened. Were either? Either a traffic accident or a rape that might not have even happened. I was wondering how such violent and disastrous events can stem from such uncertain causes. From such? Uncertain causes. Uncertain context. Causes. Causes. No, they're not uncertain. The causes are fairly, um, fairly clear to those of us who live here. In this hall, and there was a man called Narayan Desai, who was giving what is called a Gandhi Katha. Katha means a sea of stories, a, a, a long story. And this man is the son, he's in his 90s now, He's the son of Gandhi's private secretary, a man called Mahadev Desai. Mahadev Desai died many years ago. This man, Narayan Desai, is his son, and he's now in his 90s, and he wrote the first uh, full-length Gujarati biography of Gandhi, which was published just not very long ago. It's in four volumes. And uh, Narayan Bhai Desai, at that age, had made a vow to conduct 108 Gandhi Kathas all over the country in penance for what had happened in Gujarat in 2002, where you may have heard, if you've studied recent Indian history, there was a large massacre of Muslims, uh, communal riots like the one you're referring to in Muzaffar Nagar. I mean, these things happen regularly in our country. So there was a very, very uh, bad episode in 2002 um, and you know it's a very controversial issue because the chief minister of Gujarat who presided over that is now one of the front runners for the Indian prime ministerial post so it's a very very um, divided and contentious atmosphere now in the country people haven't forgotten what happened in 2002 but anyway that's a digression Narayan Bhai Desai decided in 2002 that as penance, as a Gandhian and as penance for what had happened, he would undertake a series of Gandhi Kathas. Now what the Gandhi Katha means that he sits for as long as four days, sometimes five days, and he goes through the whole of Gandhi's life. It's a form of storytelling. In India, you know, you have a long tradition of storytelling. People sing and people tell stories, they don't necessarily all write, write it all down. So this is the oral tradition of Indians telling each other what happened in the past or praising someone, you know. So this was Gandhi Katha where for four days or five days and sometimes up to seven days, he would just sit in one place and there would be a large gathering and he would then proceed to tell them about Gandhi's life. And there would be little, it would be interspersed with songs and so on, but basically the idea was to relate the story of Gandhi's life. So he'd go through the whole thing and then come to an end and then go to some other place and start again. So he did it 108 times from 2002 till this year at that age. And he's frail, poor fellow. I mean, I saw him here. So I came here for his Gandhi Katha in January this year. And um, he was sitting here and this whole hall was full. And it was really fantastic. It felt as if one was in the presence of a historic, you know, like a real living historical presence. Because he was a young man when India was partitioned. He saw Gandhi. He was, as a child, he was with his father. When Gandhi went to jail, he was there. So he saw Gandhi's life at close quarters. He was there when Gandhi lost his wife as a, as, a small, as, a, as a small child, but he saw all those things. And uh, the way he was relating it, it really brought it all to life. So, and I remember when he ended it, uh, of course it, it ends in a tragedy, and this is the place of the tragedy, this where you are now, you know. So, uh, he also said that I don't want anybody to clap or to say anything or to, you know, raise any slogans. Just after it's finished, be silent for a minute and go. It was a very, very moving experience. So, um, yeah, so you have some ideas of nonviolence and Swaraj and so on. And uh, 
those are all very relevant to Gandhi. Uh, but, you know, Gandhi had no doctrine as such. He uses words like this, like Swaraj, and of course he is committed to non-violence. Uh, but other than that, he didn't have a system or a theory. So he's not a, a, a doctrinaire theoretician of a certain politics. He doesn't give you a body of work which says, this is my politics. He always used to say that my life is my message. You know, uh, whatever you want to read of what I'm written, ple writing, please read the latest thing I have written because I keep changing my views uh, from time to time. So you can't pin him down and say, oh, you said this at that time. Because when he was in South Africa, he used language which could be even described as racist. He talked about kafirs and so on. But he grew out of it. And he tempered his views, you see. So he was a man who was not ashamed to admit that he was learning. He was learning and kept on learning as, as time went on, you know. Um, and he came into India and started working in India relatively in, in, in relative middle age. He was not a young man. He, he was already in his 40s. So uh, it's, it's a very, very dramatic story. And uh, there's not much I can tell you. If, if Narayan Bhai Desai takes seven days or four days to tell you the story, I obviously won't be able to do anything like that. I'll just introduce you to some things. Um, and then maybe we can have a discussion. Um, the thing that attracts people to Gandhi is uh, his activities and his approach to human beings rather than a set of ideas and doctrines. So, you know, we, are in a, we live in a world where people have cut and dried political ideas. And we tend to relate and make political alliances on the basis of ideas. But I remember personally that I was attracted to Gandhi through the heart rather than through the mind. Because at the level of ideas, there are many ideas that one might disagree with, even sharply, or the way that he put, put them. But you realize that there is a dimension which is overrides the level of ideas. You know, there's another dimension altogether. And, um, you know, we are a profoundly sentimental people. In India, people are highly sentimental and highly emotional, or rather, I'm sure people are everywhere, but we wear our emotions on our sleeve all the time, you know. Uh, you, you know, you can see, uh, uh, even in public life, people getting very emotional and upset, and, you know, they express their sentiments very freely. And, uh, when I try to understand Gandhi, it's, as I said, even now, even though I'm a scholar and I'm an academician, I teach, I write, but I still relate with him more at the level of the heart than at the level of the mind. At the level of the mind, however, there is a very profound um, aspect, which is, which you rightly raised the question of um, both Swaraj and nonviolence. Because I think you may have heard of Martin Luther King's speech in 1958, where he praised Gandhi and he talked about it's it's called his path to my journey towards nonviolence, Martin Luther King, and he said that um, the choice today is not between violence and nonviolence. The choice today is between nonviolence and extinction. That means unless we practice nonviolence the whole human race will get extinct. So that's actually a very profound point. And uh, I think it, it, it's a very deeply philosophical point also, because somewhere in Hind Swaraj, Hind Swaraj is one of his first tracts, which where he talked about uh, the free India of his dreams and so on. And it was something which many people have criticized as being romantic and anti-technology and anti-industry and so on. But one of the things he says there, he's, it's also a discourse on violence and nonviolence. He writes it as a dialogue, you know, like the platonic dialogues with two people arguing with each other. That's how he wrote it. So he's arguing with a terrorist, a revolutionary terrorist who believes that the British have to be driven away from here by violence, otherwise they'll never go. And he said, uh, 
very interesting line. What is obtained by fear can be retained only as long as the fear lasts. What you get by frightening someone, what you get by fear, you can retain only as long as the fear lasts. So what he's saying is that if you obtain something by violence, then you have to construct a regime of violence to retain it. It's another way of saying that I cannot obtain love at the point of a knife. It has to be obtained through dialogue. It has to be freely given. These are things that even the ancient Greek philosophers talked about. Love and friendship are freely given. Love and friendship obtained by violence cease to be love and friendship. They become something else, you know. So he has a dialogic approach to truth. And the concept of love is very, very powerful in his idea of human existence. And the significance of Gandhi is that at, at a time of human history, which is the worst bloodletting ever known. I mean, I suppose all of you are aware of 20th century history. And the 20th century is the most bloody century in the history of the human race. Anything between 175 to 250 million people, depending on how you calculate it, died unnatural deaths during the course of wars, genocide, First World War, Second World War, everything that happened in China and Japan in the 1930s. The whole thing up to 1950 already, you know, maybe over 100 million people had died. The Second World War alone, 60 million people died. The 30s, the period that Gandhi was very active, the 30s are also the period of the rise of Mussolini and Hitler. It was the interregnum between two wars. So given the time and the ambience of violence and hatred and extremist nationalism that Gandhi was operating in, it is truly a miracle that such a person appeared and spoke and did what he did. You know, when Gandhi died, Einstein said this. He said, uh, generations to come will scarcely believe uh, that a man such as this ever walked the earth. It's a very interesting comment. And, you know, the, the, all the physicists were plagued with the conscience of having him. No, but Einstein had a communication, had some letters exchanged with uh, Gandhi. So, that's what I'm trying to lay out before you, the stark contrast between the very brutal and violent climate of world politics in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Between that on the one hand and Gandhi's politics and doctrine of nonviolence on the other hand. There's a stark contrast. I'll just give you an example. Nationalism is by and large associated with a lot of nation animus. Nationalist animus towards the imperial power, towards the other, towards the occupation, towards colonialism, etc. There's a lot of anger and animosity in nationalist uh, movements. But Gandhi always used to say, I don't hate the British. I just want them to leave. I don't want them to rule over us. It's not that I have any animus towards the British. And he went in 1931 for a round table conference to Britain. And that's a, that's a long story as to how far it failed and succeeded. It probably failed because they were unable to arrive at a consensus. It was a round table conference, including all the different uh, participants in the national movement and the British. The idea was to hammer out a consensus regarding the future. This is 1931. And while he was there, I've sent that in a link to you also. I've sent it to Anmol. I've, I've sent some links on Gandhi. I don't know whether you've got them. But uh, yeah, it's all right. Four or five links I've sent and you can share it. So he went, um, he insisted on going to Lancashire. Lancashire and Manchester, these were the places where the, they were the headquarters of the cotton mill industry. And you know, one of Britain's major exports to India was cotton textiles. And Gandhi had started a campaign of boycotting English textiles. You know, it was called Swadeshi, that you bet, it's best for us to use 
textiles produced by our own artisans because the uh, industry made cotton is wiping out the Indian artisans, the people who weave handlooms. So they make a kind of fetish out of wearing hand woven cloth. It's called khadi. Even here, you'll see, you know, there'll be a lot of things. And there's the charkha. The charkha is a symbol. Uh, but actually, it's a little wooden machine for making thread out of cotton. And Gandhians would, he would always be sitting and weaving thread. He would say, everybody can contribute something, you know. Um, for instance, I mean, there's one story of a woman in central India once saying that I'm weaving this, uh, you know, as a contribution to the country, you know, because Gandhi Baba has said so. So it was a way of involving very ordinary, simple folk into the movement. But anyway, the campaign was, there was a campaign in India against foreign cloth. The demand had dried up. Exports to India were drying up. So then he said, I, go, I want to go and visit them, the workers. And um, the police apparently warned him, the British police. They said, don't go to Lancashire. You'll be physically assaulted. Because, because of your Swadeshi campaign, uh, British workers, English workers have been driven out of jobs. He said, that's exactly why I want to go. Because I have to explain to them, uh, you know, what, uh, what the Indian position is. So, he went and there was this famous American journalist who used to be the Berlin correspondent for the New York Times, William Shirer. You may have heard of him. William Shirer has written books on Hitlerism and the rise of Nazism and so on. He's written a whole history of the, of the Third Reich. So William Shirer was accompanying Gandhi at that time in 1931. And he went there. And uh, he said that Gandhi was, uh, uh, was assaulted, but out of love. It was the most amazing thing because he went to a factory where there was a large number of women workers and he was being taken around the factory and the manager of the factory said the workers would be very happy to meet you. They all heard about your coming. He said, yeah, I want to meet them. That's why I've come here. And uh, immediately the word was sent out and all these workers gathered together. And there's a famous photograph which has appeared. By, it's in the public sphere so you can find it. Gandhi at Darwin. Darwin is the name of the town, D-A-R-W-E-N, in Lancashire. And apparently, and the story is related. It's, it's been written down by uh, one of Gandhi's aides, that when he went there and he started to speak a few words to them, um, they just interrupted him. They were all basically women, women workers. There were just one or two men there. And they just stopped, and they, they stopped him midway and they began to shout, three cheers for Mr. Gandhi. You see? And everybody said, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray. And they all hugged him. And they all stood in line and someone took a picture. And you can see Gandhi there looking very peculiar. You know, he's got this dhoti, Indian dress, dhoti, and he's got a shawl around him. And all these uh, women workers, all, some people throwing their hats in the air and shouting. And the, the, what is remarkable about that photo is the sheer love in the faces of these women. You do not get a leader of a national movement, an anti-imperialist movement, a movement which is seeking to drive your country out of uh, the colony. You do not get normally the citizens of that country expressing so much love and affection for the leader of that movement. It's quite remarkable, you know. And as Shaira remarks, he said, those workers knew instinctively that they are in the presence of a man who has devoted his life to helping the poor. So they didn't need to be told about the pros and cons of, uh, of the national movement and Swadeshi and so on. They just experienced him as a human being. So that's how many people experience Gandhi. You want to say something? Would you count Gandhi as the leader of the movement? Because from what I've seen of like, the work he did in South Africa, and then how he was almost asked to come to India, especially by the Indian National Congress, because of their movement trying to gain independence. I feel like Gandhi's more, he became the image of the 
like revolution and an image of the movement, but would you count him as the leader and like the decider of the movement itself? You see, that's a good question. He was certainly one of the tallest leaders and in my view, the tallest leader of the Indian national movement. He was not just an image and a front, no. Actually, his interventions transformed the national movement completely from being an elite phenomenon to being a mass movement. So Gandhi is a very crucial figure in the transformation of Indian national movement into a mass movement. Previously, there were gatherings of the Congress year by year, but they were gatherings of the elite, the intelligentsia, the English-educated elite, the middle class. But Gandhi transformed it into something that appealed to ordinary people. He brought the Indian peasantry into the national movement, unprecedented. Now, there were a lot of other actors in the drama, yes, true. And there were a lot of people who resented his stature as a, as a leader of the national movement. So it's very contentious. Um, and the country ended up being partitioned. And Jinnah emerged as a leader who insisted on saying that Gandhi is a Hindu leader and I am a Muslim leader. You see, but Gandhi, when he was asked in Britain, uh, you know, and the British were also playing this game all the time. Whenever they would invite him somewhere, he was invited to Oxford, he was invited to universities and so on. He would speak something and he would be presented as a Hindu leader. Now Mr. Gandhi will present the Hindu case. Now we have heard the Muslim case, now we will hear the Hindu case. And Gandhi would say, I am not presenting the Hindu case. If you want the Hindu case, go to the Hindu Mahasabha. There was a separate organization representing Hindus, a communal organization. Gandhi would say, I am representing the Indian case. But they always tried to put him into that straight jacket. He was a Hindu, but he was not a representative of Hindus. Okay? So, for instance, he started a four annum. Four annas is like, you know, a couple of cents. It's like a centime. He started a four anna membership for the Congress. So, all you have to do is pay four annas, which is a very small amount of money, and become a member. And tens and tens of thousands of people became members. And he insisted on bringing the peasantry into Indian politics. That's why he's so respected. That's why he, even in this Gandhi, Gandhi Smriti, you'll find the maximum people who come here are basically poor Indians, not the middle class. In India, the middle class, a huge section of the middle class despises and hates Gandhi, let me tell you. It's very interesting phenomenon. Gandhi is more respected among literate people and educated people around the world than he is here. But that's talking of a certain stratum. You know, there's even a whole tradition which celebrates his assassination. Literally, they associate with the politics of his assassin. And that's one dominant stream in Indian politics today. Whether they admit it or not, I mean, even if they heard me saying what I'm saying, there would be a row. Be, that's the amount of contention there is over Gandhi. The fact is that the man who killed him belonged to a stream of thought known as Hindu nationalism. When Gandhi was killed, one of the first things that the Viceroy of India said, Mountbatten said, thank God it was a Hindu. Meaning, thank God the assassin was a Hindu. Can you imagine what would have happened had the assassin been a Muslim? But he was killed by a Hindu who believed that actually Gandhi was too pro-Muslim. It's very interesting. So, there was a constant attempt to portray Gandhi as, as an elitist or as uh, um, uh, uh, just a Hindu leader and so on. That's not true. He was not just a front. On the contrary, he was the last statesman in the world who lived his life so close to his people. There's no one since then. And this comment was made by um, a man called Dwight MacDonald. Americans may have heard of him. Dwight MacDonald was a radical journalist in the 1940s, talking about the war. He was one of the few Western journalists who condemned the atom bomb, the bombing of Hiroshima and so on. He was a very remarkable journalist. And he was here in India at the time. I think there's a possibility, if I remember right, he was even in, this, in these premises when Gandhi was killed. And he wrote an essay on Gandhi immediately after Gandhi's death, saying 
that this is the last man whom one sees moving around with his people. He lived his life with the people. He was not protected by guns. Today, every other bureaucrat in this country has half a dozen gunmen around him with 10 guns. It's a status symbol. Gandhi refused protection. Even after there was the, the attempt on his life, there were five attempts on his life, and the last one succeeded. And the last one was staggered into two parts. He was attacked here on the 20th of January, 1948. He used to have prayer meetings right here. And he, there was a bomb which went off, a grenade or something went off. The idea was that after the grenade went off, the assassins would come in the confusion, shoot him and get away. But somehow their plan didn't work out. He heard the grenade, he thought it's something else, he refused to comment about it. He carried on his prayer meeting, that ended. Later on the police found out that there was an attempt on his life. But he refused to take armed protection. He said, I don't want it. Whenever God calls me, I'll go. You don't find people of... So people associate non-violence with cowardice. Actually, Gandhi was perhaps one of the most physically courageous men one can ever think of. Even when he went to the end... You've heard of... You've heard of the Pathans. My Afghan friend has heard of the Pathans, but most of them, I hope, through him you'll hear of the Pathans. The Pathans or the Pakhtuns are people who live both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that area is now known for the Taliban. It's known for extremism. It's known for hate and violence. Actually, few people remember that one of the staunchest supporters of Gandhi was a Pathan. His name was Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Even here in this country, he is known as a frontier Gandhi. People love him. He's, he's, uh, he's portrayed as a second Gandhi and he has been given uh, honors by the Indian government. But he was a Gandhian. He was a tall man. He was devoted to education. And he set up a movement there called Khudai Khidmatgars. You know, in that whole area. Uh, which is now called Pakhtunistan and, uh, you know, NWFP, Northwest Frontier Province, or federally administered ter territories, FATA, all these zones, you know. So, it's very interesting that the British never allowed Gandhi to go there until 1938. They allowed the Muslim League to go there, but they didn't allow Gandhi to go there. This is before India was partitioned. And he went in 1938, and if you see the photographs, again, it is remarkable, because here is this man, who is a short fellow with a dhoti, you know, and he refused, he, and the Pathans, you know, are generally they carry arms. He said, I don't want to see a single rifle over here. No guns. So he was actually escorted into Pathan territory without any guns, which is very remarkable, because in, in Pathan territory, you are not a man until you've shot a couple of people, I'm sorry to say. But uh, he, he, had that, uh, he had that aura. And again, if you look at the photographs, there are these uh, very, very tough and virile men who are looking upon this uh, little fellow with a great deal of love. In fact, I don't know whether you know it, uh, but uh, uh, whether my Afghan friend knows it, but in Peshawar in 1930, there was a famous incident in the middle of a nationalist upsurge. There was a civil disobedience movement going on, and it was affecting the whole country. And the Pathans and the... Khudai Khidmatgar movement was very powerful then. In fact, by their agitation, they tied up a whole lot of British troops in that area, which would otherwise have been used against Indians in the rest of the country. And there was a famous incident there, because the, uh, the Khudai Khidmatgars had taken over the whole city of Peshawar. And there's one bazaar there called Kissa Khawani Bazaar in Peshawar. And over there, there were certain clashes between protesters and the police. And the British had got so desperate that they called in the army. They called in the British army because, they, because the police couldn't handle it. And they called in a battalion which was one of the most loyal battalions of the British. It was called the Garhwal Rifles. Garhwal, Garhwal is, a, is a hill district in India. And these are fellows recruited from there, you know. So the Garhwal Rifles was called in, 
and they had distinguished themselves in the First World War. You know, the Indian Army, the British Indian Army was used by the British in the First World War and the Second World War all over the world. They were used even in colonial expeditions in China in the, in the 19th century. So they made a lot of conquests based on the lives of Indians. Anyway, this Dwal Rifle Platoon was called in there and uh, they were all Hindus. The, the mass demonstrators were mostly Muslims. And there's a famous incident where the platoon is ordered to open fire. And the head of the platoon, a man called Chandar Singh Gadwali, if you haven't heard of him, please now remember his name. Chandar Singh Gadwali. Chandar Singh Gadwali is, not, not many Indians talk about him either, but he was a platoon commander, you know, a soldier. He was not an officer, but a sol soldier. He was asked to open fire, and he turned around and told his British officer, I'm not going to shoot. And he said, the Indian army was not meant to shoot Indians. So he stopped, he lowered his rifle, and everybody lowered their rifles. And of course, he was cashiered and sent off and captured and so on. But it had a profound impact on the people. His name became known all over. And after that, he spent many years in jail. And he, he was also, it emerged. I have read a little story about him. You may have heard of Rahul Sankritayan. Rahul Sankritayan is a great Indian intellectual. Uh, he wrote a little biography of Chandra Singh Gadwali, in which he says how Chandra Singh Gadwali had happened to meet Gandhi in the hills in 1929, just a year before this incident. And apparently Gandhi was giving one of his kathas. He was sitting, he had gone for some, some religious, for some trip up to Gadwal. And he used to there also meet people and have, you know, discussions. So at one point, um, Chandra Singh Gadwali was sitting in the audience and he, uh, uh, he was wearing his military cap. So Gandhi jokingly said, you think you're going to intimidate me with your army cap? So he said, sir, I'll wear a Gandhi cap. You know, there's a Gandhi cap which all these fellows used to wear, all the, the, the nationalist agitators. It was a cloth cap. It was like a cap, an insignia of nationalism. So he said, I'll wear your cloth cap if you give it to me. So somebody gave him a cloth cap. So he said, which means, I'll take it from the hands of the old man only. So then the cap was given to Gandhi and then Gandhi chucked the cap at him and he wore it. And he, and he, and he got up and, and he said, did namaste. So these are all stories. So Chandra Singh Gadwali is one person who was affected by non-violence when he refused to shoot people. So this question of violence and non-violence is one very important thing is that non-violence can grip you even if you're a soldier. You don't have to be committed to non-violence before. Suddenly, the idea of non-violence or refusing to kill someone, suddenly the idea can come to you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just address your question. I don't know how many of you have studied the Russian Revolution. I'm sure you have some idea of it. It's a very famous thing. But are you aware that the Russian Revolution began on International Women's Day? And International Women's Day, what was happening? The Russian Revolution was actually sparked off by women. And there were all these women who were out of jobs, there was no food, there was no bread, there was a crisis. They were all out on the streets. And the soldiers of the Petrograd garrison were lined up against them and at some point they were asked to shoot them. And the soldiers were young fellows, they may have seen in the women, they may have just seen an image of their mothers or something, you know. So someone said, I am not going to shoot. The one soldier chucked his rifle. Who knows who he is? He's dis disappeared in history. But someone chucked their rifles. And when they chucked their rifles, everybody else started saying, we are not going to shoot these women. You know, that began the Russian Revolution. So that's it. There's a, there's a religious line that that is the beauty of grace, it never comes too late. So nonviolence is not a doctrine that gripped people. It's just, it's just either an emotion or a decision. You know? Okay, you wanted to ask something. Uh, just connecting back to nonviolence and violence. I'm almost saying that you were part of the Naxalwari movement as well. You want me to talk about that? Yeah. Your yeah. personal experience, so how did you start? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, all right. I wasn't going to talk about personal stuff, but I don't mind if you want me to know. I myself was a Maoist. I don't know whether you've heard of Indian Maoism, but Indian Maoism today is making the news. There is an insurgency going on in parts of the country. Uh, I suppose you know what Maoism means. Okay. So the Maoist movement worldwide, uh, it's one wing of the communist movement, an extreme wing of the communist movement, aligned with, with Mao Zedong and the Chinese Revolution. So it's a long and complex story, but the international communist movement, as you know, got subdivided. There were the people who were pro-Russia, pro and there were other factions which were pro-China and so on. So the, all those disputes took place in the 1960s and 70s. But what is relevant to you here, to this story, is that in India, the Indian Communist Movement got split. It's, a long, it's an old history, it goes back to the 20s and 30s, but the Communist Movement got split in the 1960s, and a Maoist faction emerged. Basically, their position was that you can't change anything in India unless you pick up arms. So the idea was an armed peasant revolution, similar to what took place in China. If you have some knowledge of Chinese history, you'll know that there was a People's Liberation Army, that there was a Communist Party set up an army, and there was complete chaos in China for many, many years prior to 1949. There was a civil war, and there was nationalist Chiang Kai-shek pitted against the communists, then the Japanese invasion. So, China was subject to warlordism and civil war for many years from the 19, late 1920s right up until 1949, okay, for a period of 20 years. That had a big impact in India, so on the Indian communists. So there was a faction of the Indian communists which aligned with that doctrine of building a people's army and so on. It's, it's a complicated doctrinal uh, exercise to explain it all, but I won't, I'll just give you the simple facts of it. So there was a movement in India which was called the Naxalite movement. Naxalite movement, it owes its name to a village called Naxalbadi in Bengal, North Bengal, where there was a clash between workers, peasants, tribals on the one hand and the police. That was in 1967. So movement sprang up from it called the, the Naxalite movement, which is the Indian name for the Maoist movement. And the idea was that you have to build a movement in the countryside, make a people's army, a guerrilla force, and repeat in India what happened in China. Build up a strong people's army in the countryside. Okay, so that was the politics. Now, I happen to be part of that. When I was a youngster, maybe just a little older than you, I joined that movement. So now I'm talking about 1970. That's more than 40 years ago. So in 1970, I went underground as a fugitive, as a member of this, uh, of this movement. And the move, uh, it attracted a lot of young people from different parts of the country, campuses. You may have heard of the late 60s and the student rebellion of the late 60s. I'm sure people are aware of it. I mean, this was all over the world not just in India. Even Berkeley and Columbia were gripped by, by you know, student radicalism. In America, there was a group called Students for a Democratic Society, SDS. Then there were groups like the Weathermen and so on in, in, in the States in those days. The, 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 the period 1968 to 70, around that time, it was, there was a very radical mood all over the world and part of it was affected by the Vietnam War. There was an uprising in France. It's called the May 68 uprising. It's a historic event and I hope you all know about it. It's very important. It's one of the few utopian moments in modern history. Because you know that 10 million workers were on strike in France in 1968. It was un unbelievable. I was a student at that time and I remember talking about it to my friends. And even the newspaper, everybody was aghast. They said, how is it possible? The whole of France shut down. Then that was the time of General de Gaulle. And General de Gaulle used those famous words, you know, the students are shit. Shi and Ali. The students are Shi and Ali, which means a pile of shit in a bed. 
you know, and and uh, the students responded to him saying, "Le chien lit c'est lui," meaning you're the pile of shit. So this was what was going on, and the whole of France was cracking up. NATO was mobilizing its troops, so it was not like Russians mobilizing their troops to protect their bloc. Here was NATO mobilizing troops. Now NATO is intervening in Afghanistan, but NATO was then intervening in France to protect France from going communist or being falling under the control of the workers. So it was a massive crisis. You don't know it now, but if you read up about it, it's fascinating. The books have been written just on that one year, 1968. And 1968 was also the year when man reached the moon. Okay. Yeah, 69 they landed. But 68, they took that famous photograph. They did a chakkar of the moon and took that famous iconic photograph. So it was a very exciting time. It was a very radical climate, and it was the middle of the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War affected my generation in an unimaginable way. You should know that. We were very, very affected by Vietnam. Because, you know, Vietnam was being bombarded. And this is all very topical, incidentally, because just yesterday or day before, one of the most famous generals in world history died. Nobody even knows. His name is Vo Nguyen Giap. Giap, my Afghan friend has heard of him. Giap was a Vietnamese general. He's just died at the age of 102. He died two days ago in Vietnam. And Giap was the main general in the Vietnam War. More than that, he was the general who was the architect of France's defeat in the famous Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954. And he was also involved in the defeat of the Japanese. So he was involved in the defeat of the Japanese, the defeat of the French, the defeat of the Americans, and then the defeat of the Chinese, because the Chinese invaded Vietnam in 1979. The four major powers whom Vietnam defeated and threw out. He's a character who actually is on the same level as Hannibal and Napoleon. Literally, I'm speaking as a historian. Giap is a, is a general who in world history has the stature of Napoleon. He's that important, but we've forgotten him. But those days we all knew Giap and we knew Ho Chi Minh, you know? So Vietnam was waging this war and it was being bombarded. Do you know the amount of ordnance dropped on Vietnam during the Vietnam War was more than all the ammunition used in the Second World War by everybody. That's how much they dropped on Vietnam. And they used chemical weapons. They used Agent Orange. They used napalm. It's all well documented. I find it very funny when America says they don't like chemical weapons because they invented it and have been using it. You know? At least, a napalm was invented by an American and it was used widely to defoliate the forests. You know, there was a My Lai massacre and there were all kinds of the stories were coming out every day. So the whole generation of youngsters all over the world, not just in this country, even in America, the American students and American workers, they launched a campaign against the Vietnam War. And it's very interesting, the Vietnamese never used terrorism. They could have also blown bombs in the subway and all, they never did it. They just fought on their own terrain, you know? So that affected us, and we all, the large numbers of us became affected by this movement. And so in India, the communist movement, young, young youth radicalism was affected by Vietnam also. Anyway, I'm digressing. The story is basically that I joined that movement. I was in the revolutionary underground for two years, and that was a very turbulent time in Indian politics because Pakistan broke up just that moment of time. 1970, there was an election in Pakistan. The man who won the election was shoved into jail. He was a Bengali leader called Mujibur Rahman. I, I'm sure you've heard of the beginnings of Bangladesh. Bangladesh and Pakistan were part of one country. They separated into two countries. So Pakistan was part of India. India was partitioned in 1947. Then the partitioned country was itself partitioned in 1971. This is the logic of partition. Once you start going, that, going down that road, it never ends. You know, so Pakistan broke up in 1971 as a result of a massive campaign to suppress Bangladeshi uh, national aspirations. And there was a massacre let loose by the Pakistan army in Bangladesh, which was still an eastern province of Pakistan, in March 1971. The leader 
of Pakistan then was a man, a general called Yahya Khan. So they launched this crackdown in the university. It started in the city of Dhaka. And university campuses were subject to machine gun and tank fire in university hostels. So there was a massacre. There's a very famous American, famous in Bangladesh, but I think Americans have forgotten him. His name is Archer Kent Blood. Has anyone heard of him? Archer Kent Blood. Archer Kent Blood was the American Consul General in East Pakistan. He was the last American senior diplomat in East Pakistan before Pakistan broke up in 1970-71. And he observed what is going on. And you know, the president of the US then was Nixon. Nixon and Kissinger were riding high in those days. And Archer Kent Blood and all his fellow fellows in the, in the consulate, they were furious with their own government for supporting the Pakistan army. They said, what is going on here is a genocide. So Blood sent a telegram, and it's become famous as the Blood Telegram. If you, if you type it out on Google, you'll get it in a second. The Blood Telegram. He sent a telegram to Nixon and Kissinger saying, "What we, our silence is unconscionable. This goes against everything that America stands for. There's a massacre going on over here by the military of innocent civilians. We have to do something. So, of course, he was shifted out of his job. You know, Archer Kent Blood died in 2004. Most Americans don't know him. But in my view, he's an American hero. He's not an American hero in America, but he's an American hero for the rest of us because he stood up for his conscience, you know. And people from Bangladesh attended his funeral. So in Bangladesh, everybody knows Archer Kent Blood, but in America, people haven't heard of him. All right. So these are the things that took place then. And since you're asking me about, you know, why I changed, I mean, that moment made me change. The Chinese support for the Pakistan army and all that made me change, you know. Uh, I got out of Maoist politics. But as regards Gandhi and Gandhiism, I, I joined Delhi University as a teacher in 1980, uh, 1974. But in the, in the early 80s, I was part of a movement. I, I went on a hunger strike for the salary of a poor man who had been of, of, a, of, a, of a gardener. And it's a very long and tedious story, but I was physically attacked. So I suffered a murderous attack on myself. My leg was broken in two places, my face was smashed, my jaw was smashed and so on. So I had a violent physical attack. And I remember after that there was a big, big movement. And for me, you know, I learn all my lessons the hard way. So for me that, you see, when you undergo violence, then you either go completely haywire in your thirst for vengeance and revenge, or you think. And I remember a lot of students telling me, you know, we'll do the same, we'll reply, you know, we'll bash up those guys. I said, just don't do it. Because if it's so horrible, when it happens to me, why should I feel that I can do it to somebody else? You know, you have to draw the line somewhere. Uh, so it made me think about violence. And after that, I began to take Gandhi far more seriously. I realized that this man is saying something which is of great consequence. It's very profound. It's not a minor doctrinal matter, you know. <coughs> so that's just a personal story. I mean, I have been in a kind of violent politics myself, and I've also suffered violence physically, personally. And all these experiences have obviously helped me to think about the question of violence. But I think I should just get back to Gandhi. I'll just sp spend another five minutes, and then I'll stop, and then we can discuss whatever. The fact is that Gandhi did transform the national movement into a truly mass movement. It's a fact. Secondly, Gandhi was a religious person. He didn't make any bones about it. He didn't pretend to be a secular or an atheist or anything like that. People say, Politics, you should separate religion and politics. He, should say, he used to say, for me, uh, you know, politics is religion. I mean, I have to bring in religious ideals. Now, you can see it, you can use it, these words, religion and politics, or you can use the word morality and power. We may agree or disagree about separation of religion and politics. What would you say 
If I asked you, can you separate morality from power? Should power and political power be exercised with an ethical sensibility or should we be ruthless? Obviously, there is a place for ethics and morality in politics, in public life. Public life deprived of any morality, of any sense of ethics, is public life which is going down the tubes. Okay, so I think that's what he was trying to say. Secondly, he was challenging the religious leaders. He didn't allow the religious leaders to come into politics. He used to debate with them. But he didn't raise religious demands. You look at his 10-point program, you know, in 19, uh, 1930, the civil disobedience program, 11 points rather. I mean, none, none, nothing to do with politics. It was to do with imperialism, colonialism. Look at his speech when he went to London in 1931. His speech was about Indians and how they're suffering, economically and politically oppressed. It didn't raise any religious demands. He kept the religious bigwigs out. He was religious and he would debate with them. And remember, he was debating with the whole of society. He, was he wanted to bring everybody together. That's why he gave a long rope, a lo lot of leeway to anybody who wanted to debate, including very conservative religious people. He would debate with them. You see? But the thrust of the argument was against colonialism. Now, he was he was made to look as if he is just a Hindu leader. Some people want to do that. But the challenge that Gandhi posed was that he challenged all the religious leaders to bring their high-sounding ideas into reality. All religious leaders have a lot of very nice, high-sounding things to say. But he was saying, let's see you transform it into reality in the public sphere. Now, you know, religious guys, people will say, you know, Islam doesn't believe in violence and Hinduism doesn't believe in violence. Oh, we all believe in live and let live. You know, people say some very nice sounding stuff, but he was challenging them to actually translate it into reality. Okay, so that's something that you have to keep in mind. That he was attempting to appeal not to a section of the community. Now, in India, there were large numbers of movements based on caste, on religious community, all kinds of other movements. So there were many other actors in the drama. That's a fact. You have to keep that in mind. Now, I'll just come to the last bit. You see, this is last phase. It's, look, Gandhi's life is a tragedy. It's both a triumph and a tragedy. The way he died finally woke up the country. You know, because suddenly they realized this, the hatred that we have built up for years, we have let it take away this man. You've seen Attenborough's film now, a large part of it is true. It's true that he went on fast in Calcutta, you know, in 1947. He undertook a fast. And in the midst of all these riots and so on, the country was being partitioned on grounds of religion. And there was a mass meeting going on in one of the big grounds in Calcutta in which Hindus and Muslims together were celebrating Eid. You know, Eid is a religious festival for, for Muslims. They were celebrating Eid in the middle of all this hatred. It's remarkable. Mountbatten sent him a telegram saying, I can't maintain peace in Punjab even with 50,000 troops. But I salute, as a soldier, I salute the one-man boundary force of Mahatma Gandhi. You stop the violence. So it is remarkable. He was with the people right through that period, 1940, you know, 1946-47. He was very sad. He didn't want the partition of the country. He didn't want the transfer of population. He said, never transfer population. In India, we have a long tradition of people, ethnic cleansing is going on in this country. It's been going on since the 40s. All kinds of people of all communities, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, they're being forced to, you know, go walk across boundaries. Gandhi used to constantly say, never do this. He was very close to the people and he realized transfer of population is not the solution to anything, you know. So his last days were devoted to communal peace. And that's the atmosphere in which he was killed. The atmosphere in India in 1947 was full of hatred because the country had been partitioned and Hindus and Sikhs were coming away from that that part of the border, which now then became Pakistan. It was their home, it was their villages, it was their city, but they suddenly were told, you have to get out. There were massacres. 
up to four to five hundred thousand people were killed in that one year. Most of them in Punjab. You see, Muslims were being forced out of here, and he, you know, his last fast. I'll I'll stop with that because I know you're getting tired. His la he used to undertake fasts as a kind of, you know, public penance. He went on fast. The last fast of Gandhi ji was January 1948. It's one of the most controversial also, and few people know enough about it. But one has to study. I studied it. <clears throat> Recently, I was asked to write an essay, and I've sent you that essay. You know, that was an essay for students about Gandhi. And I wrote the essay just about his last fast because when I started reading about it, I suddenly felt as if this man is speaking to me. You know, it was as if his it was like his last will and testament to the people, not just the people of India but the people of Pakistan as well. His last testament, everything he had fought for all his life, he was talking about in those last days. You know, he had a premonition that he's going to be killed, and. As I said, the the attempt took place over 10 days. First attempt on the 20th of January, successful attempt on the 30th of January, right here, just a few steps away from here. And when he went on fast, he was asked. You know, the 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 myth is that Gandhi went on fast to force the Indian government to pay 55 crore rupees to Pakistan because that was owing to them. And the Indian government was stalling on it, and Gandhi said, "You have to pay it." So there's a lot of hatred directed. Oh, see, he's giving money to Pakistan. This is what he was. He's always pro-Muslim. Actually, that was not the issue. The issue was that in the atmosphere of partition, a lot of religious places had been seized. A lot of temples and gurdwaras were seized in Pakistan. Lots of mosques were seized in India. One such is Babri Mosque. In Ayodhya, which became the site of a huge dispute, so in in Delhi, close to Delhi, there's a little town called Mehroli, and there's a famous old monument to a Sufi saint called Bakhtiar Kaki. And Bakhtiar Kaki's monument is famous for being a place of pilgrimage to both Hindus and Muslims and so on. But it's a Muslim shrine. It had been seized, and the people who ran it, the Khadims, they had to run away. So Gandhi said before he went on fast, he said the tomb of Bakhtiar Kaki has been seized, and the Khadims have been forced to run away. We cannot let this happen. It has to be returned to the original owners. What will happen to Jama Masjid? If it's, is it going to be transformed into a hospital? All these holy places. So because the Sikh holy places were in Pakistan. No, some Muslim holy places. So many, so many of them. He said, "What are going to happen to all these places? We are not going to demolish them. They have to be restored to the original owners." So he went on fast to restore Bakhtiar Kaki's mosque, the Mazar, not mosque. It was a Mazar. It was a tomb to the original owners. He said they must come back. And alongside it, he said, "We must stop this communal violence. We must ask all the Muslims who have run away from here, who are living in camps, they must go back home." And his last scheme was to go back to Pakistan with all the Hindus and Sikhs who have been forced out of there. He wanted to take a long caravan. They, those it was called kafila. Kafila is the name for caravan. There were caravans which were 50, 60 kilometers long. People running. He wanted to take a caravan back to Pakistan, and he wanted to go to Pakistan and bring Muslims back to India. That was his scheme. So he went on the last fast, and that was what he was planning to do afterwards. You see, and during those days when he was on fast, he went on fast on the 13th, 13th to 18th, five days, and the whole climate in Delhi was transformed. Of course, there were people who were saying, "Let the man die. We've had enough of this nonsense." And there were other people saying, "Yeah, you know, he's saying something right." He was trying to calm down the atmosphere. You know. There was terrible hatred. You can imagine that so many people have been killed. You can imagine the hatred. So he succeeded, and people issued a famous declaration called the Delhi Declaration of 1948, in which they said, "We will welcome 
All, um, all the people who have been run away, we will welcome them back. The tomb of Bhaktiar Kaki will be restored. We will re-establish re peace and friendship among Hindus and Muslims. We will not use the police and military for this purpose. We will see to it that communal amity is restored, etc., etc. He said, if you don't have communal peace in Delhi, what's going to happen to the rest of the country? Okay, that's how, that was his last fast. It succeeded. Had he not succeeded, there would have been an Ayodhya temple dispute brewing outside Delhi also. Anyway, and then unfortunately, uh, on the 30th of January, he was shot dead. Okay. It's very unfortunate because he might have had a very much more beneficial impact on Indo-Pak Indo, Indo relations and so many other things had he not been killed at that moment. But that was a very big shock in India. Suddenly the atmosphere calmed down. You know, the killings and all that calmed down. And suddenly people began to appreciate, you see, what he had done and what his message was. Okay, I think I've spoken enough. I think that you're also getting tired. And if you have any questions, you can see that it's a very, very long story. It's a very long and dramatic story. It's full of tragedy and triumph. And it's got a lot of lessons for humanity at large. It's got nothing to do with Hinduism. It's got to do with humanity. This episode is brought to you by Think Global School. For more information, visit thinkglobalschool.org.